please enjoy continuing your lunch, but we are going to get started with our program today. The University of Missouri Board of Curators announced the appointment of Dr. Moon Choi as the 24th president in the history of the University of Missouri system on November 2nd, 2016. The former provost and executive vice president of the University of Connecticut, Dr. Choi succeeded interim president Mike Middleton on March 1st of 2017. Dr. Choi graduated from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign with a bachelor's degree in general engineering in 1987. Later on, he earned a master's degree and doctorate in mechanical and aerospace engineering from Princeton University. Prior to serving as provost and executive vice president, Dr. Choi was dean of engineering at UConn from 2008 until 2012. Earlier, he was department head of mechanical engineering and mechanics at Drexel University and assistant and associate professor at the Ill University of Illinois at Chicago. We are very pleased and proud to have, to have Dr. Choi with us today as the 24th president of the University of Missouri System. Good morning. Good morning. Well, first of all, I am so pleased to be in Columbia, Missouri. And uh, as you know, I spent about 10 years at the University of Connecticut. And in the East Coast, there is a sense of the New York mentality that anything outside of New York is not worth considering. But if I were to show my friends in Connecticut how wonderful this community is, what a great university that we have, I think they will be all very surprised. So I am so pleased to be here. So, Ms. Harper, thank you very much for the introduction. And also, I want to thank uh, Jerry Dow and Matt McCormick for organizing this event. And Mr. Griggs, thank you very much for supporting this very important, I believe, discussion about the future of the University of Missouri system and how we can work together with the community to achieve the goals that we have, which is how do we create a stronger University of Missouri system that contributes not only to the education and research, but also for economic development. In many ways, flagship universities like the University of Missouri system serves as an economic engine. But there's more that we can do and many of you that I've, met, that I've met with since I was announced as the president-designate uh, have shared with me great ideas, whether it's public-private partnerships, working with industries to grow internship programs, or providing more opportunities for smaller companies that want to work with larger OEMs in leveraging university and faculty research. And those are all programs that I really want to explore. So I'm very excited to be here, and also spending time over the coming months meeting with the community to discuss how we can develop those partnerships together. So today, I'm gonna to share with you some of my broad vision, share with you where we are as a university system, and to discuss some of the partnership opportunities that exist that have not yet been leveraged. So I think that would be very key. Just a little bit of background about me beyond my academic, uh, academic uh, uh, CV is that I was born in South Korea in 1964. I was born 11 years after the end of the Korean War. And at the end of the Korean War, Korea was the second poorest country in the world. But the growth of Korea as an economic power would not have happened without the human capital and the resources and the support from generous Americans, both directly as investments, but also generous Americans who decided that they're going to leave their lives of comfort in the United States and go to Korea and support poor students who didn't have an opportunity to go to college. My mother was one of those individuals. Mrs. Klippenstein is a nurse who grew up in Kansas, and she decided in 1955 
she was going to go to Korea and train young girls in nursing. My mother was one of those young nursing students. And because she was trained as a nurse in 1973, when there was a nursing shortage in the United States, we were all enabled, allowed to come to the United States as a family with permanent residency. So the contributions to my own family and to my own homeland of Korea from generous Americans is something that I value and appreciate greatly. And to know that there's such a strong connection because of President Truman and the Korean support, it makes me even more proud to be working at this university and to be part of the Missouri community. So I'm very grateful for that. So now, what I'd like to do is spend a few minutes talking to you about where we are as a university and also talking about some of the broad visions that I have that I want to develop working with community leaders and the university stakeholders. So let me begin that presentation. All of us are very proud to be part of a great university system. But what makes for a great university? There are metrics that are very, very important. Obviously, first and foremost, it's the emphasis of undergraduate and graduate education. That's going to be key. But at the same time, we're a flagship research university that needs to focus on extramural research, <coughs> federal research, and more and more industry research. On top of that, if you look at the middle column, there are measures of academic performance that support student outcomes. As a University of Missouri system, we need to increase both retention rates and graduation rates. We are, as a system, higher than the national average, but we can do much better because the graduation rate also defines cost of education. It's not just a tuition. If you attend a school with a 40% graduation rate, you can spend all of that time and money, but if you don't graduate, you don't have that degree to rely upon. So it's very important to focus on that. But at the heart of a university is the key stakeholder, faculty and students. Our ability to recruit and retain outstanding faculty and students is going to be key. But we need necessary support services in infrastructure, as well as facilities, as well as equipment for our faculty members to be successful. And going forward, those are the areas that we're going to be focusing on. So as part of a new strategic planning process that we will be launching at the fall semester, it's going to be our key principles for focusing on excellence in everything that we do. If we are not performing at a level of excellence that we define, we're going to evaluate whether or not that program will continue. And given the budget environment that we're facing, it's critical for us to continue that process. But focusing on what makes a university great, research, teaching, as well as engagement with the community, and creating a diverse and inclusive community. But as part of that, we need to have not only new resources, but reallocation of resources. We can't be great at everything. So what are we not going to do so that we can become better in the programs that are important for us? So some of the broad vision for research, we need to focus on extramural research. And I'm going to be meeting with the faculty council tomorrow at Mizzou and we're going to be sharing with them that there are great opportunities for us to leverage our collective strengths, not only at Mizzou, but as a system, to go for institutional proposals, like a $25 million engineering research center that will place the University of Missouri system on the map and allow more students and faculty members to come to our university to continue their career. It's also very, very important for us to focus on access and affordability. But I also want you to recognize that tuition, list price tuition, is not the cost of education. There's tuition discount, there's need-based scholarship, there's merit-based scholarship, and on top of that, it's the graduation rate. If we can graduate our students in four years at a very high rate, 
that's much better than providing a lower tuition, but we don't, but that prevents us from allowing to have more sections of courses so that students can graduate on time. And so these are the trade-offs that we're going to have to examine to create a stronger university. It's also very important for us to develop the type of core research facilities that not only enable our faculty members to perform the research, but develops a type of partnership with industry. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that based on my experience at the University of Connecticut. We can be a magnet for industry participation in our research, but currently, my assessment of the landscape is that we don't have sufficient core research facilities, whether it's in imaging, manufacturing, or high-performance computing. It's also very important for us to create an inclusive and diverse environment for our students, our faculty, our alums, and all of our stakeholders. And that starts with not only hiring faculty, staff, and administrators from diverse groups, but also working hard to create a pipeline of program. In many ways, universities play the game of poaching faculty members from one university to another. That doesn't grow the pool. We have to have the programs in place that enable us to develop the pool of students who are going to become faculty and administrators as well as leaders in industry and government. And that's going to be key. So during my career, beginning at Drexel University into the University of Connecticut, we worked on all of these programs that are pipeline programs for diversity, starting with upper bound all the way to the bridge to the doctorate. It takes a concerted effort with faculty members and staff and students committed to growing that pipeline. But during the period of 2009 until 2015, at my previous institution, you can see that we grew underrepresented minority undergraduate students in the STEM discipline by a factor of two. We also increased the number of grad, undergraduate bachelor's degree by almost 80%. It's also important to see we grew the number of PhD students who are underrepresented graduating in the STEM disciplines. This is the only way if we are going to make a constant and sustained change for us to be able to develop the types of program that will make a difference to our community, to our universities in the future. Let me talk a little bit about economic impact, which I know is a very key topic for all of you. I placed on here the economic impact of these institutions to their state based on their research, operational spending, visitor spending, student spending, as well as charitable contributions that are provided by service learning and service experiences provided by faculty and staff. Those are pretty impressive numbers. University of Illinois, $13.9 billion. As a system, I believe they receive less than $600 million as appropriation. So imagine the impact that they're having. University of Minnesota, $8.6 billion. Now, all of these universities are comprehensive with a strong medical school as part of that system. We have not yet done this type of analysis, which is done by a firm called Trip Bumba. But we're going to be launching that as a system to evaluate what our impact is and understand our impact county by county so that we can demonstrate the impact that we have in regions throughout the state. But if we look at the analysis performed by two of our distinguished economics professors, their estimate, based on our contribution for instruction and research as a system, that we are contributing approximately $3.5 billion annually. And because of our research and instructional programs and workforce development, that the economic growth rate is 25% higher than what it would be without the University of Missouri system. These are some elements of our impact that we need to share more and more with the community with our alums, and also with our elected officials 
to demonstrate the value that we bring. And that's going to be key, a key message for all of us to say what we contribute to the state's economy. Another key element to growing that partnership with industry and economic impact is innovation and entrepreneurship. This occurs throughout the state. You have three examples here. There's a company that was formed by one of our faculty members named Delbert Day, Missouri s and And he's using very innovative bioglasses for wound healing. There was a company that was established called Mosai in s and And soon, there's going to be a major announcement from one of our key partners, Ameren, as an investment for Cortex. And that's going to happen, I believe, sometime next week. But this is an idea where we can enable all of our faculty, students, and staff to participate in innovation activities that make a difference to the region and to the state. And right here in Mizzou, we have Bill Turpin, who's leading a very important innovation center. But the beauty of this center is that it is discipline agnostic, which means that you can have a fine art student, a journalism student, engineering student working together in the incubator space to take the best ideas and bring it to market. And that's going to be key. And the key word here is really discipline agnostic. And it's faculty, students, and staff with support from the business community and alums to ensure that the best ideas that occur at the University of Missouri continues to be leveraged into the marketplace. Let me pass this one. And uh, just as a way of going back to my experience in developing these types of programs and how important it is for all of us to work together to create that economic development, I share with you one example. In, at the University of Connecticut, we work with Pratt & Whitney. Pratt & Whitney is a, is a gas turbine manufacturer for both stationary and for uh, aircrafts. They wanted to move into a new area of research in which they don't have to machine or cast their gas turbines. So they want to look at additive manufacturing. And they approached the University of Connecticut and asked us if we have faculty experts working in this area to be able to use metal powders to actually additively three-dimensionally manufacture the gas turbine blades that can eventually be manufactured into a complete gas turbine. As part of this, they invested together with us $7.5 million to locate their additive manufacturing facility at our facility where they can train their employees where they can have faculty research together with their scientists, as well as providing internships for the students. This was the first major project that we were able to launch. But based on that, we were able to approach General Electric to have a similar project that supports their area of business. And then we realized that we needed to have a core facility that was going to be world class. And so we decided to partner with a company called FBI that manufactures the world's foremost electron microscopy equipment to be able to analyze materials down to the angstrom level so that we can determine how molecular dynamics can be used to create the materials of the future instead of just using materials that currently exist. And as part of this, the $25 million is used to purchase five pieces of equipment that enables industry partners to come and partner with us because each one of these equipment is three to five million dollars <coughs> that industries can't afford. And even if they can afford it, they can't maintain it. And so that partnership worked out really uh, very well. So as part of that industry partnership, we were able to develop these partnerships that you see there as well as our ability to work with industry to submit proposals for the National Network of Manufacturing Innovation. And so my previous institution, because of these collective investments, we were able to get three NNMI supported, working with industry and the federal government for this purpose. 
And so these are the types of partnerships that we want to expand. And uh, all of the chancellors and provosts are very excited about the concept of having core facilities at the university. Okay, now let me talk to you a little bit about the budget. And uh, as you can see from here, as a university, we are going through some seismic shifts. And let me just share with you, it's not just at the University of Missouri. This is happening at all public universities as well as private universities. You've heard recently that, that Harvard University with their $25 billion endowment is also going to have to do some cost cutting. So this is the reality of life in higher education. What you see there on the red line is state support as part of our revenue. In 2000, it was at 62%. Currently, it's at 35%, and I believe for 2018, it's going to be even lower. So we see where the trend is going. We also recognize that we have to be more private-like. We have to be able to raise our own resources. Otherwise, anyone that sees this trend will say, well, you better have a plan of how you're going to be getting out of this situation. What you see going up in blue is the tuition revenue. But that is not <coughs> tuition increase. That is primarily due to enrollment increase. And so we're able to actually weather the storm of having reductions in state cuts due to our ability to grow our revenue. But as we move forward, we also recognize that we have been very prudent as a university. And if you can see there, shown in the red boxes, is during the past 10 years, how much our tuition increased? On average, our tuition increased at about 2%. And CPI is about 20%. We were just slightly above CPI. Now in the media, you hear so much uh, conversation about cost of education going through the roof where increases are about three times above CPI. Well, if you live in Kansas, if you live in um, Kentucky, I think that's the case. But not at the University of Missouri. There's been prudent leadership that actually did some very effective cost cutting and strategic planning for us to be able to meet the needs of the state while keeping costs very affordable. And if we look at where we are, even though we have the lowest tuition increases, if you look at where we are in terms of per capita spending on higher education by state, we are one of the lowest. Illinois is lower, but their in-state tuition is probably approaching $16,000. So they are trying to get out of their budget situation by charging higher tuition to their students. That's not the approach that we use. But going forward, we have to be very creative because we need to grow the resources to continue to build a University of Missouri system that is stronger. And that's going to be key. And for all of us, we have to see where the levers are, where there is capacity, like in Mizzou, we're going to increase enrollment. We're going to have some creative marketing strategies. We're going to talk about the wonderful things that are happening on our campus and why students should come to the University of Missouri. We should also look at more out of state and more international students who will pay a higher tuition, which enables Missouri students to attend school at a lower rate. We also need to find ways to work with donors, individual donors, and corporations to grow the type of infrastructure support, scholarship, and professor research support for us to be able to compete with other top flagship universities. Last but not least, developing a stronger partnership. Now, I have some ideas, but I'm sure you have some great ideas, and I would like to hear them. And this is going to be the first of many conversations that I'm going to have with Matt and many others to talk about how the University of Missouri system can best serve you. It's going to be a partnership. And I'm very excited to be here. 
And I have to say, I love Colombia, and more importantly, my wife loves Colombia. <laughs> and, uh, so I'm sad. And, uh, but I am, what's it? Tremendous honor for me to be here. And one thing that I will guarantee is that I will live and breathe my job. It's that important. It's that important for public education. It's that important for the faculty members. We have an obligation to all of our stakeholders. So thank you very much. And I believe we have some time for questions. And uh, I'd be pleased to entertain some questions. So thank you. This is not a bashful group, I know that. <laughs> we have Missouri 100 here. Yes, yes. How long did it take for you to put the program in place with the University of Connecticut? Um, about nine years. And the reason it takes nine years is companies are not interested in making that donation. There has to be some benefits to the company. So it started out by my visiting with the companies and bringing with me faculty members who are very innovative researchers. Then they start with small projects. Basically, it's a trial period where they're trying to see, can we actually deliver? Because there's a sense that faculty members don't really care about deliverables, timelines, and so forth. So you've got to select the right faculty members. And so if I can just give you one example. With Northeast Utilities, which is now Eversource, which is the major amaranth on the East Coast, they were very interested in storm damages. And they were bringing in crews and placing them all over the state without realizing where the damages were going to be. So we had our faculty members in tree management and hydrological modeling to better predict, based on the forecast, where the damages are going to be based on tree conditions and the lines that are there. So it started out with a small $100,000 project. Now it's a $9 million investment. That took about five years. But if we don't start that now, it's going to be a long time before we realize it. But first and foremost, industries get really excited about faculty expertise and the opportunities to work with outstanding students. And we have that. And so it does take time. So we've got to start yesterday. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Yes. I didn't see in any of the slides any mention of infrastructure, uh, except for a couple of buildings. And I know from my past experiences that we really have some critical infrastructure problems in not only new buildings, That's right. but maintaining what we have. So thank you. Um, currently, I believe we have about a billion dollars worth of deferred maintenance needs. And one of the things that I'm hearing in speaking with faculty as well as um, deans and senior leaders is that we don't have sufficient resources, research facilities, or teaching facilities to compete. And so we're going to have, as I stated before, we're going to have to find some different ways of developing research and teaching space. And we're having conversations already about private-public partnerships. And we can't always rely on the state to come up with additional resources because if you look out into the future, where is there going to be additional resources coming in to support the type of building needs that we have at a billion dollars? That's just us. Imagine all the other state universities and K-12 schools. So we have to take it upon ourselves and say, what are the most critical things that we need to do? We also need to downsize Buildings that are no longer needed, let's demolish them, mothball them. And so we're going to have to cut to become stronger, but at the same time, we have to find some private-public partnerships to build the buildings that we need, especially here and, uh, well, all of the campuses. I can't play favorites. Everywhere. <laughs> Everywhere. Uh, yes. Or a comment. Any recommendations for me? Yes. How are you going to get this message out to, I mean, we're all here because we're uh, investors. Sure. Um, how are you going to get the message out to, we're having a terrible time getting students from St. Louis after the last year and a half to get back to 
from the zoo here to our campus. How is this message going to get to St. Louis to 18-year-old kids? And let's face it, they really don't care about boosters, the 18-year-olds. Um, so how are we going to get to their parents to let them know that this is the message, this is what we're going after, and to get them back onto campus here? So I think we're going to have to use many different strategies. Um, but obviously, a marketing campaign that talks about what makes this system great and research is very important. All four campuses are research intensive, research extensive universities. I think that's key. It makes a difference. And we have to educate parents who say a research university is not a university that diminishes undergraduate education. It's far from the truth. It enhances undergraduate education. That's one. Second, all of the leaders are expected, I'm mean, going to expect them to go out into the communities and talk about the great things that are happening. Visiting the chambers, visiting high schools, visiting civic organizations, that's going to be key. But also, we need our alums. We need our stakeholders. We need our extension partners to share the same message. But if they don't have this uh, vision to share with them, it's going to be very difficult. So we need to give them talking points for this. And so it's going to be a multifaceted effort. But we do need all of you. We need all of you to share what are great things that are happening. Because you do hear in many cases when you say, when people say, well, I'm from University of Missouri, and they'll say, oh my goodness, you had some big problems there. You know what? We were able to manage it. But did you know? Did you know that we have some of the best faculty members in plant sciences? That we have some of the best faculty members when it comes to materials research or cybersecurity? Those are the talking points that we need to be able to share. And uh, it'll take some time, but we're going to get there. And I'm committed to continue to share that positive message. Thank you. Yes? President Troy, have you formed an impression about the collaboration opportunity among our four campuses? Um, the answer to that is yes, broadly. Um, our campuses operate very autonomously. We need to have not only um, more collaboration than shared resources, but I want to see more collaboration <laughs> in academic programs. So for example, if, if a student from UMSO received an internship in Columbia, I want that student to be able to enroll in the Columbia class seamlessly because they're part of the same system. Right now, we operate four different, four different variations of student information systems. They don't talk to each other. That's a problem. We want to be able to offer distance learning throughout all four of the campuses seamlessly. Also very importantly, we need to have more collaboration on research, faculty research. Because in, individually, we're not very, well, Columbia is big, but the other three campuses can really leverage their strengths with the other campuses if they were able to develop that partnership. And so my job, working with my senior leaders, is to identify those collaboration opportunities, seed those funding, but also hold them accountable so that they deliver results. Thank you. Yes? Hey, could you introduce who you are? Uh, my <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Do you have a time frame in mind that you can share with us? So the time frame that I established was to have uh, candidates visiting sometime in April for airport interviews and to have more substantive meeting with the finalists in May, I believe. Um, it's my understanding that we have a very robust pool of candidates because this is a terrific university, so I'm not surprised. But we also want to make sure, we also want to make sure that when we make the decision that we have outstanding candidates from which we can select the chancellor to permanent chancellor to leave this campus. So sometime in May is when I expect that to occur. And uh, I'm very excited about that. And I'm sure the candidates are excited about the opportunities. 
Thank you. Yes? Could you talk a little bit about, as you know, one of the chamber's top priorities is the research reactor. That's and right. the expansion of our research reactor and how important that is to our economy, how important that is to job growth, job development, and also just to the community and the healthcare community around the world. Uh, could you talk a little bit about your vision of the research reactor and that expansion and how that fits? Thank you. That's, uh, that's an excellent question. When we talk about shared core facilities and programs that actually distinguish the University of Missouri system, the MURR is right up there. It's the largest academic nuclear reactor in the country, twice as large as MIT's. What we do there is so critical. And for many um, uh, outsiders, when they hear about the nuclear reactor, they probably think we're generating energy. We're saving lives. That is a key focus for that facility. The opportunity for us to partner with <coughs> pharmaceutical firms as well as healthcare providers that are trying to reduce the cost of healthcare can be tremendous. But currently, they reach their max in terms of growth opportunities. They also want to develop a 70 MeV cyclotron which can really take it to the next step in terms of the type of research they can perform. But that's going to cost about $70 million. Where does it come from? It's got to be a public-private partnership. But if we can work with the Department of Energy, who's, who currently does some of that work, but they want to get out of that business, because they, have, they shouldn't be competing with us, then perhaps there's some opportunities where the Department of Energy put some of their resources into that type of facility. But it is a crown jewel, and we have to support those crown jewels. And I was just blown away by Ralph Butler's leadership. And if you haven't met Ralph, uh, Ralph is terrific. And we need more people like him leading the innovative programs. Thank you. All right. Um, any other questions or comments? Yes, last question. And I'm Joe Manhart. Yes, thank you. And I, uh, I just want to observe, I think the more you interact with the legislature, the more popular you will become. I think you are very clear. Thank you. Uh, in fact, let me just share with you, I, I've i met with the legislators since November 2nd, and you know they have good advice for the university, good advice for me, but their deep commitment to see this university continue to achieve excellence is key. And our governor, our governor has said on so many occasions, focus on excellence. And that's what we're trying to do. And so I'm very excited about that. In fact, uh, Jefferson City will be my second home. And I will also be visiting <coughs> legislators in their home districts so we can share some of the positive things <coughs> that are happening. And one of my first trips is going to be to the Boot Hill. And uh, that's going to be exciting. I look forward to it. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>